Hi, I'm James. Hi, I'm Charlotte. We're from the Canterbury Ecclesia, a small family-based Christadelphian church just outside of Melbourne. We're excited to be hosting this presentation and a live Q&A on the topic of Israel, God's peace plan for a troubled region. I'm sure if you're like us, watching some of the horrible conflicts on the news recently is both confronting and confusing. But we believe the Bible not only explains the background of how we got here, but also gives a vision of a peaceful future for the Middle East and for the whole world. This lecture is being presented by a member of our community. He presents a detailed historical background behind some of what we can see on the news today. If you're like me, you might hear many opinions about whose fault it is, who is provoking who, and depending on how far back you go, who started this conflict. Well, I'm excited to listen and to learn. So let's jump right in and we'll talk to you on the other side. Well, thanks for that introduction, James, and thank you all who have joined me for this very important presentation on a very high profile topic of late. So we'll work our way through a number of biblical aspects of this and we'll also be touching, of course, on some of the current issues. I would imagine that our uh, current perception of Israel is, as we've been seeing in the news media over the last few weeks, the rocket attacks from Hamas, from, from Gaza, and the Iron Dome activity of Israel, where their rockets uh, take down most of the incoming ones through that very uh, sophisticated program they have. We've also seen the uh, response of the Israelis, where they're responding with attacking uh, parts of Gaza, rather the tunnels where they believe Hamas have their weapons, or taking out buildings, all these rather amazing photographs we've seen where the uh, Israeli Air Force can uh, get these missiles to really take out the foundations and we just watch a building collapse. It's quite fascinating. Um, and, of course, it's, it consumes the world in watching these uh, issues of just what is going on there. And hopefully what we'll address tonight will give you some further understanding of how these things are and just how it does fit in to the plan that God has as revealed to us in the Bible. Now Israel, as you would be well aware, I'm sure, is a very small country in the very uh, central part of the Middle East and it's amazing how much activity and how much profile it develops for such a small country. And that of course of itself is interesting in the sense of well how did that come about and we'll have a look at a number of those aspects as we go through this evening. We're all we're familiar with seeing Benjamin Netanyahu. He's really been synonymous with the state of Israel for the last several years. Been in and out of politics over many years, but he's certainly been the front uh, and the, the forefront uh, presenter for quite some years now. I think it's in the range of 15 years. And we regularly see him addressing the United Nations or making, a, as he's doing there, or making other various comments. Now, I think we should say here that um, we are not, endorsing here any form of government of Israel. We're looking at God's purpose with the with the nation. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we endorse either the government of Netanyahu or its activities or alternative governments for that matter either. Uh, we're concerned with how the activities of Israel fit in with the purpose of God. Because God clearly has a purpose with Israel. Now that doesn't mean also, of course, a very important point, it doesn't mean that Israel is necessarily believe in God or that anyone there, any Jew, is more righteous than anyone else. It's a fact of life that they've been selected by God for this purpose and they have a, some of them have a relationship with him and others are quite secular in their outlook. And that is another aspect that would come to the fore when these other events take place and Israel does realise that God has been behind a lot of things that they think they've been doing themselves. We've also seen of late, uh, not anywhere, anywhere near as well known, but uh, the leader of Hamas, uh, Khaled Mashal. He mainly spends his time in Qatar, but he directs Hamas from there. And he's been the, uh, the other side of things in presenting the alternative view to the world and generating you know, the, the press to make sure they're aware of the Palestinian side, which is his right to do, of course. He's supporting their view. Uh, even if it's quite contrary to the view of Israel. And, of course, then various countries and various individuals around the world 
form their own view on whether they're going to be pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. Now, what might be a surprise to many people is that this is not a recent development. The situation has been developing for 4,000 years. And you might think, well, that's a bit outlandish, but we'll, we'll have a look at how that came about. Uh, it's a very important aspect, though, that it does go back quite so far. And the other aspect is that the, the current activities and the conflicts have been triggered by an event that occurred in 1948. So there's 73 years gone by there, which is quite a lengthy period of time in some ways, but small in relation to the total scene of history, of course. Now, going into the Bible, in the second book of the Bible in Exodus, uh, God speaks to these people of Israel saying, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So quite significantly there, we can see that there's a select purpose for Israel in the eyes of God. He has chosen them for a purpose. And we should mention that uh, we haven't got time to go through all these verses surrounding this matter. It's very huge. Uh, that he didn't select them or all of them because they were more righteous than others, but because of their connection with Abraham, as we shall see, and also because he needed a nation to retain his word and to keep his word for the people of the world. So what really comes out of that is, well, where did these people come from and why were they chosen by God? So the background to that, and we're talking you know, roughly 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC, uh, we read there in the book of Genesis that the Lord said to Abram, which was his name before God converted to Abraham, and he was told to go from the country he was in, which is the north of Israel, and to your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And then we see some very key points. This is a promise of God. It's not just a, a general line. This is a huge promise which is kept in currency for all that time. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this promise was renewed to Abraham's son Isaac and to his grandson Jacob. And from Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. So this promise rolled down through all those generations and continues. There are three key parts, as you'll probably deduce from that. The first of all, there would be many descendants. A great nation would come from him. That the land he could see would be given to his and his descendants forever. And that out of this line of people, one would come who would bless the all the families of the earth, if they accept that descendant. And that descendant is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to deviate into the genealogies to establish that, but because of the time factor in that, but Jesus Christ does descend from this line of Abraham, and that is a huge part of all these promises. Another key one, which is what causes the issue that we're looking at in relation to Israel and the Palestinians, is this matter of, Abraham being told that this land would be his and his descendants forever. And it is fundamentally the, the land of Israel that it is now, but going further north up to the river Euphrates. Now, just getting further aspects of that, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. So that's expanding on the other parts of that, as well as the great nation and the descendant, there is the land and he would have that forever. That doesn't mean, of course, that they were not to lose part of it for a period of time, but they were to return to that land if they were disposed from it. And it is quite clear, and it's talking about forever, not just a partial occupancy of that land. So that is the key to the issues that keep occurring in the land of Israel. Now, just a bit of background, because as you're presumably quite well aware, the Arab nations, so they also have descended from Abraham, and that is quite true. They, they do, and the uh, Islamic religion makes uh, reference to that. 
although we should note there that Islam developed some 600 years after Christ, which is some 2,600 years after Abraham, and they don't have that link of all those prophecies and the re written records that go right back into that time frame. Nevertheless, they did clearly descend from Abraham. And we can see there on the one side of the screen that Abraham, through his wife Sarah, had Isaac. He had a son called Jacob, and Jacob uh, was the one who his children were the tw formed the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's a key point in all those promises, and the promises were renewed, as I said, to Isaac and to Jacob, and through that they flow on into all his descendants into the nation of Israel. But again, we should say that that doesn't necessarily mean that every individual within Israel endorses that fact or acknowledges God. Just a couple of bits here. We're not going to go into all the history of Israel. That would be a couple of nights in itself. But some of the key issues, they they were sent out of the land at various stages. 721 BC, 10 of the tribes were sent up to Assyria and did not actually return from there. 587, Judah, the main two tribes there, to Babylon and returned some 70 years later. Another key point is that from BC 63, the region was controlled by Rome and that became quite significant in other events. Rolling on from there, we finally move into the, the period after Christ, the 70 years after his death, the resurrection, after his birth, uh, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. So the Roman occupancy was quite significant in their history. And then in 135 AD, after the Jews made a bit of an insurrection and tried to gain some control back again, uh, they were finally put down by the Romans and banished from the land. Now that's particularly significant because that leads into a lot of the issues that we look at as we roll through some other aspects of Scripture. And then there was various other uh, groups controlling that land. Uh, some of the Jews were still there as a, an oppressed people at that time, small groups of them, but most had been uh, banished from the land. Uh, we know this probably at 636, Muslim groups took over and kept running that for some period of time. Different ones would come and go. Another key issue was that from 1517, uh, an Islamic group known as the Ottomans out of Turkey conquered the region and they held it for 400 years. That's a very significant event when they were they were defeated and things changed from 1917. And then we find in 1948 the state of Israel proclaimed. So that's a rather condensed coverage of the history of Israel, but it does give us a, a, a handle on some of the key issues that have occurred. And the main bit being this banishment from the land and then ending up later with the state of Israel proclaimed after some 2,000 years. Now, this aspect of them being sent out of the land was known from the very early times. They were told, and I'm only doing a section of this here, again, because of time issues, but they were told that if they disobeyed, various things would happen to them. And the key one there is at the top of that slide, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. Then further down, and you shall find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. The Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. Well, that really did become their lot in life after they were dispersed from Israel, particularly from initially in AD 70 and then completely in AD 135. They were spread across the earth and had a generally a very miserable time. They were oppressed by whatever nation they were living in, apart from some small numbers of them who would get into quite uh, positions of power and influence, but that was most unusual. Most of the dispersion, uh, they ended up in Europe. We see these are the countries where by the, the certainly the mid-1900s, there were millions of them in this area, and they developed into that area after they were dispersed from Israel in 135, mainly following in more or less on the coattails of the Roman army as they went through these areas, and so they set up trading posts and villages and towns and generally grew into quite a, a large group of people spread across these countries. Uh, by the 1930s, there were some uh, 6 million of them in Poland alone and others, very large populations of them in most of those countries we see. Uh, again, we will skip the detail of that. I'm sure you'll 
fairly familiar. That's where they were. Now, they weren't solely there, but that was the primary area where they were. Others were in the still in closer regions, North Africa and uh, some of the surrounding Arab countries of Israel. But by and large, the majority ended up in this European area. Now, many of the prophets, I'm just taking one here as an example, the prophet Jeremiah spoke at great length to the Jewish people and in chapter 16, verse 14, he was saying that, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, As the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, for I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. So we can't overestimate the significance of that, that they would be dispersed, but God would bring them back to their own land. And this is the basis of the issues we see before us in the current era. And things began to develop. They were, I say, they were away for almost 2,000 years, and then late 19th century there were stirrings. And we're just going to touch on some of the key issues here. Theodore Herzl didn't actually invent the idea of this of returning to the homeland. A lot of Russian Jews were particularly pining for it, and many throughout Europe. Theodore Herzl had the capacity through his uh, his intellect and his social connections. Uh, for, he wrote a book about the need of them to return. The Judenstadt uh, developed a huge profile, and he also had the capacity and the sophistication to meet with very uh, senior statesmen. He ended up speaking to the Pope. The, the Sultan of Turkey and the, uh, the Chancellor of Germany. So he really got into these senior people's role and positions and he had that uh, level of capacity to talk that through. Uh, interestingly, though, he didn't do it for religious reasons. A lot of people think he must be a very religious Jew. Strangely, he wasn't, but he was clearly a man who suited the purpose and was utilised by God to spread this message of the, re the nations of the world really ought to start thinking about helping the Jews get back to their homeland. Herzl's activities generated a series of events called the Zionist Congress. They developed a, quite a large profile. This is a photo taken at the second one in Switzerland in 1898, and they uh, developed a massive profile that influenced the world. It was just the beginnings in many ways, but it was starting to make people think there was a huge issue here that needs to be addressed. Then there was what was called the Balfour Declaration, where the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Balfour, was the one who put his name to it, but it was endorsed by the British government, in particular the British War Cabinet at the time, and they acknowledged the right of the Jews to a homeland in Palestine, which, as you might imagine, caused a huge issue with the Jewish population, thought it was wonderful, and it also strongly resonated with Bible believers who were looking for a time when the Jews would return to their land in accordance with Bible prophecy. A lot of people dismissed that idea, but genuine Bible believers were looking for that. And interestingly, the, behind it, there were religious reasons. Uh, a number of the war cabinet who endorsed this were very strong on this view of they should facilitate the return of the Jews to assist in bringing about the return of Christ. So was a surprising number of Bible believers amongst them. But, of course, there were also military and political reasons behind it. And we won't go through that, that's a topic in its own. The other big issue that came really on the tails of that, um, the following month, December 1917, as I said before, the Ottoman Turks had been controlling the Palestine area for 400 years, and that ended in December 1917 when the British army and its allies, uh, led by General Allenby, uh, conquered Jerusalem. And this was the iconic photograph of the, the grand entry after the fighting had ceased. And so they were key events which started to open the way for the Jewish people to come back if they wished to. And again, it's, we take another prophet. This was a key issue in the prophecies that had been given to Israel and also a key issue in prophecies that were being looked at by people who were studying their Bibles. From Ezekiel chapter 11, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. So another prophet with a very clear message. They will come back at some point. 
Now, we won't spend too much time on the detail here, but there were various events happening in Europe that facilitated a lot of them returning. They wanted to get out of the uh, extreme persecution, particularly in Russia. You see the numbers there, relatively small, but moving. By the time we get down to the 1920s, they're starting to crank up because they're also getting uh, Arab persecution. And they start to move out. And then in the 1920s through to the just before World War One, quite an increase in the number of Jews around the world going to uh, Israel, particularly because they could see things were going bad in Germany. And so it's the ones who could perceive where that might go who got out and migrated to Israel. Not that it was called Israel at that exact date, but particularly the area of Palestine, which had been labelled at that point. Now, interestingly, um, prior to World War II, which follows that chart there, there were, were, there were a total of about 400,000 Jews in Israel, and most of those had come, as you can see there, in the 1930s. But then there was a surge, and 700,000 of them arrived between 1948 and 1951 and most were Holocaust survivors from Europe. See, that um, then the sense that lines up with Jeremiah 16, because God said that I will send for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them, and after I'll send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. So most of those coming back were, after the war, were... Holocaust survivors, but prior to that, as I say, it was relatively small. And we can see how that fits with the verse we just looked at from Jeremiah, where you could say in some ways they were being fished back in through the eliminating the Turks out of the area so they could return and generating activities that focused on that, but only a relatively small number returned. And it needed the hunters to trigger this line of thought with them that the only option was to get out of Europe and the surrounding countries. And that's what uh, caused the massive influx immediately after the Second World War. Uh, so, so money from Europe, but quite a lot in the 1950s coming out of Arabic and Northern African countries. And so by 1960, the population had grown to 2 million, so a massive uh, hike, and now it's up to 7 million, including several hundred thousand Arabs who live within Israel itself, that's excluding the West Bank and Gaza, and they are uh, many of those uh, Israeli citizens. And they poured back, despite a lot of opposition in many cases, in many cases, opposition from the British, on vessels such as this, named the Exodus, beat up old ships they obtained and packed them full of people and sailed to Israel. And that was where most of them poured back in. And as a result of all this, in 1948, the 14th of May 1948, the uh, Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel is born. Now, that was uh, in, in fairly much immediately acknowledged by President Truman from the United States and then by other nations. They said they were you know, the genuine government. They acknowledged that. But it's been described by one commentator as a statement um, made as an expression of hope, not as a statement of fact, because, as he was saying it, the Arab armies were gathering to try and destroy Israel as they did not want it to be there. And that led to the uh, 1948 War of Independence, which went a, a brutal war between the Arabs and the Israelis. And at that point, we're going to have a look at a, a video that will give us uh, a little bit more information on just what occurred in that time, because it is a very significant uh, timepiece. For Israel, 1948 was an eventful year, to say the least. A year earlier, a historic vote in the UN recommended a partition of the British Mandate of Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states. And in the wake of the Holocaust, the international community voted overwhelmingly in favor of the Jewish right to self-determination. By 1948, Israel's early leaders were ready to create a Jewish state alongside their Arab neighbors. But not everyone in the international community was so supportive. Surrounding Arab nations openly threatened to wipe out Israel in its infancy. The war that ensued was complex to say the least. The 1948 Arab-Israeli War, or Fair warning, this war has like six different names, so bear with me. It was also known as the 1948 War of Independence, or Mechema Komemiut, the War of Sovereignty in English as Ben-Gurion called it, or the War of Liberation by the Israeli army, and the Nakba, or Catastrophe by many Arabs. These names reflect the different realities of the war and its consequences on different people. 
To some, 1948 was a year of miracles, as key world powers like the Soviets and Americans supported the establishment of a Jewish state, while to others, 1948 was an unequivocal catastrophe, as the war brought with it loss of life and land. So what exactly happened in the war, and why does it matter today? Let's get into it. The first phase of the war began in 1947, after the UN passed the resolution to partition the land. Jews living in the British Mandate were overjoyed, but there was little time to celebrate. Almost immediately, the Arab Higher Committee, then the political arm of local Arabs living in the Mandate, started clashes with the Jews. Soon enough, it was practically a civil war. Violent Arab riots broke out, and although the British were legally in control of the region, they would already decided to withdraw and for the most part, adopted a pretty hands-off approach to the growing conflict. However, they did maintain strict quotas on Jewish immigration from Europe, as well as on supplies, making manpower and arms shortages pressing issues. Meanwhile, the Haganah, a Jewish pre-state paramilitary force, was bracing for the possibility of an all-out war. The Arabs had rejected the partition plan and didn't believe outside nations should determine their fate. In response, Arab terrorism in the mandate was on the rise. And there was another fear. The Arab population in the region was twice that of the Jews, and the Arab media played up its military prowess. This propaganda machine spoke of total war against the Jews there and stoked more fear in the Jewish people. After several failed attempts to quell Arab aggression, which included a devastating siege of Jerusalem, Ben-Gurion and his inner circle enacted something called Tochnit, or Plan Dalit, Dalit being the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so basically Plan D. Plan Dalit remains controversial to this day, and some researchers suggest Plan Dalit was an intentional population transfer of the Arabs living there. Others, though, disagree. For example, historian Anita Shapira points out that while it did order commanders to destroy villages and expel the inhabitants if they resisted, it also instructed commanders to leave them where they were if they did not resist while ensuring Jewish control of the village. Ultimately, the Haganah seized control of certain major cities, including Haifa, Jaffa, Safed, and Tiberias, as well as many Arab villages. In total, some 300,000 local Arabs fled or were expelled before the official start of the war. Many wealthier Arabs left voluntarily, and many thought their evacuation was only temporary, with plans to return once the Jews were defeated. On May 14, 1948, the moment everyone had been bracing for finally arrived. Just before the British mandate was set to expire, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, declared Israeli statehood. Mind you, this wasn't an easy decision to come by. In fact, Ben-Gurion and a small circle of nine other leaders made the call with a vote. The motion passed by the slimmest of margins, only six to four, but Israel was born. Again, there was little time to celebrate, and no one knew that better than Ben-Gurion. On that historic day, he wrote in his diary that he was a mourner among the celebrants. Ben-Gurion correctly anticipated the high cost of declaring Israeli statehood. On May 15th, the very next day as the British mandate was officially terminated, five surrounding Arab armies, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Jordan invaded the day-old nation. Now, a few things helped Israel withstand the initial wave of the attacks. For starters, just a few days before, intelligence gathered by the French consulate in Jerusalem informed the Haganah about specifics of the Arab army's plans. Also, with the British out of the picture, Jewish immigration picked up, which meant more fighters. But these were hardly soldiers. They were ill-equipped European refugees, mostly Holocaust survivors with little to no military training. Most of them didn't even speak the same language. Imagine trying to coordinate an army when you can't even talk to each other. But the Israelis were also able to ship in more arms and ammunition. This helped the Haganah turn itself into a real army and even incorporate the Irgun and the Lehi, two rival Jewish militias. United under one banner, they formed the modern day Israel Defense Forces, or the IDF. Still, Israel's first month in existence was marked by tragedy. Jewish immigrants who had been freed from concentration camps only a few years earlier went straight to the battlefield, and thousands died in the fighting. Ultimately, it would be the bloodiest of Israel's wars. Egypt invaded from the south and eventually reached the southern Israeli cities of Ashdod and Beersheba and headed further north from there. Syria penetrated northern Israel while Jordan, the strongest of the invading Arab armies and trained by the British, captured Jerusalem. The Israelis were very much outgunned, especially at the start of the war. On May 19th, the Egyptians attacked Yad Mordechai, a kibbutz in southern Israel. There, a force of about 100 Israeli kibbutzniks and two paramilitary squads armed with only rifles, one machine gun, and one anti-tank weapon somehow fought off 2,500 Egyptians equipped with armor, artillery, and air units for five days. The Egyptians incurred heavy losses and Israeli losses were comparatively light. Still, in large part, this first month was pretty rough for Israelis. Counterattacks in Jenin, Ashdod, and Latrun failed. The IDF also failed to defend inhabitants of the Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem, which was still under siege. 
In that first month, 1,600 Jewish lives were lost. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but when Israel was first established, only 650,000 Jews lived there. A key turning point for the Israelis was a UN-brokered truce, which came into effect on June 11th. The truce was meant to be in place for 28 days, and it included an arms embargo. Basically, the idea was neither side was supposed to benefit from the truce. But of course, that's not what happened. Both sides used this time to improve strategic positions and import more weapons. Israel bypassed the embargo and brought in a massive shipment of arms from Czechoslovakia. Without that shipment, Yitzhak Rabin, then an IDF commander, later said it was very doubtful whether we would have been able to conduct the war. Israel increased its arms supply to more than 25,000 rifles, 5,000 machine guns, and 50 million bullets. Plus, with more Jewish immigrants arriving, they were able to almost double their manpower. Coming out of the truce, Israel launched a major offensive called Operation Danny, named after an officer, Daniel, or Danny Mass, who was killed earlier in 1948. The first phase of Operation Danny called for Israeli forces to capture the cities of Lod and Ramla. These two Arab cities were strongholds for Arab Legion forces and were both located on the route connecting Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Arab snipers and militiamen could pick off Jewish transport vehicles, which forced traffic between the two cities to a roundabout southern bypass. The operation to take control of these areas was a massive success. The Israelis seized the Lod airport and a strategic railway station in Ramla, as well as dozens of surrounding villages. However, it's important to note that during Operation Danny, some 50,000 Arab residents of Lod and Ramla were expelled from their homes. By the time both towns were in Israeli hands, only a few hundred of the original inhabitants remained. This was the lone case of organized removal of entire cities, according to Anita Shapira. In fact, Ben-Gurion ensured that the Arab residents of Nazareth would not be expelled because they had surrendered. The second phase, however, which was an attempt to recapture Latrun and end the siege on Jerusalem, ultimately failed after several costly attacks. Still, the partial success of Operation Danny boosted morale on the Israeli side, which was gaining ground on the Arab armies. In July, Ben-Gurion proposed attacking Arab armies in Judea and Samaria, or the present-day West Bank. He also supported another attempt to attack Latrun with the aim of capturing East Jerusalem, including the Old City, and liberating all of Jerusalem. But Ben-Gurion, a man used to getting his way, was opposed by his top military advisors, who feared another attack on Latrun would ultimately fail and preferred giving resources and manpower to other fronts, namely the Southern Negev region. Ultimately, it was put to a vote, and Ben-Gurion lost, with members of his own party voting against him. Now, diverting resources to the south ultimately proved to be a pretty good idea, where the fight against the Egyptians continued. By the fall of 1948, Israeli forces were preparing a major offensive to drive the Egyptians out of Beersheba, southern Israel's largest city. The Negev Brigade, a branch of the IDF, launched their attack early in the morning, and within a few hours, the Egyptians surrendered at the city's police station. About 120 Egyptian soldiers were taken as prisoners. This was a crucial blow to the Egyptians, as losing Beersheba severed a key supply route. On the other side, capturing Beersheba helped the Israelis take back control of the southern desert. In December, the Israelis successfully launched Operation Choref, a final assault on Egyptian forces in the southwest, which ultimately ended the Egyptian threat on Israel's southern communities. By February of 1949, Egypt officially withdrew. Israel emerged bruised and battered. In all, over 6,000 Israelis died, which was about 1% of Israel's total population, a massive loss. And this number, tragically, included some 2,000 Holocaust survivors but the country was still standing. Meanwhile, in response to Israel's victory, more than 850,000 Jews living in Iran and Arab countries in the Middle East and North Africa were expelled from their homelands, and many settled in the new Jewish state. The indigenous Arab population was ultimately the worst hit though. 700,000 fled, were exiled, and according to Arab historian Arif al-Arif, more than 15,000 were killed. Despite the huge losses Israel incurred, both from a casualty standpoint and from losing the eastern part of Jerusalem to the Jordanians, the war was still a huge success for the Jews overall. They created a new modern army, took in swaths of Jewish refugees from Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, and they started a nation in the Jewish ancestral homeland. As is often the case in history, the war had different impacts on different people though. For Israel, it was a huge success. For many Arabs, it was a massive loss. But only by acknowledging the different perspectives can we begin to unravel the true complexity of what happened in 1948. Okay, well, we can see from that uh, a number of the events that took place in 1948, and the key issue is that it was a huge moment in time. We cannot overemphasize the enormity of the prophecies that were fulfilled then with the Jews back in their land and the nation declared a nation again. So it fulfills the prophecies, and that, to say, is huge. It's probably second only to the Old Testament prophecies about a coming Messiah. It's an enormous event, 
verifies the accuracy of the Bible and we can take confidence that other events likewise occurred. What it also did, it triggered this current Islamic hatred of Jews and the nation of Israel. Because prior to that time, the Jews were living in a lot of Islamic countries, but they were tolerated because they had no real power or position. And that changed once uh, the nation was there and that nation defeated the Arab army. So it was a huge turnaround. So it's very significant for what is currently happening in the land there. I've mentioned a couple of other key issues. In 1967, the Six-Day War, the key outcome of that was that the Israelis took uh, East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount and some other, other, other areas of Israel, some of which were handed back. A lot are still uh, held by Israel, so it expanded the borders as a result of that. So again, another very significant event. Another thing I'm going to mention, and the prophet Zechariah talks about that Jerusalem would be an ongoing issue for the nations. He says, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. I mean, all who lift it shall grievously hurt themselves and the nations of the earth will come together against it. Now, we've seen this happening in a lot of cases too. A lot of world statesmen in many countries buy into dealing with the Middle East. We'll go through these fairly quickly. A lot of fascinating background to these, but we can't deal with that. 1978, President Carter, because almost every US president since 1967 has wanted to be the great man who solved the Middle East problem, and so it goes on and on. Carter got some uh, traction there with the peace deal with Egypt that did manage to hang into place to a reasonable degree. Others, uh, particularly Bill Clinton, he tried on several occasions, thought he was getting it away, and then it just all unraveled. This is the one where with President Barack and then... Uh, Arafat was there, and there was another one with Rabin, Camp David, and the Oslo Accords, and Clinton thought they got this wrapped up, and right at the death knock, Arafat refused to sign it. Devastated Clinton. Again, they tried, but it failed. We then had the Obama era. Uh, we see there John Kerry, the Secretary of State. They took a different tack of trying to well, start from appeasing the Arab end and thought they'd talk to Iran and the other Arab nations, and that should be a better way to fix it. And, of course, that went nowhere as well. Then we've seen the era of Donald Trump, uh, huge changes there. He said that the United States would recognise Jerusalem as the uh, legitimate capital of Israel because under international law that is not recognised, and he moved the US embassy there. So uh, key changes, and the other key changes, of course, were developing some peace initiatives between Israel and the uh, some certain Arab nations, as we're aware. Now, the present dispute, it's uh, an interesting uh, challenge. It's much more than a disagreement about an argument over who owns several properties in one of the suburbs of Jerusalem. That might be presented as the, the trigger, but it's, it's much deeper than that. As we said, it goes back to the who owns the land aspect as well. Even this particular arguing that the property is complex because the Arabs say they've got the legal rights to it and the Jews are saying, well, they've only had the legal right since 1948 when the Jordanian army occupied that part of Jerusalem and gave these things to the Arabs. And the Jews are saying, well, their families had it for centuries prior to that. And so the argument goes on and on. There's also much argument who are the Palestinians. There's no ancient specific Arab nation called Palestine it's a name that was attached to that area by the Romans and then also later used by the British under the mandate they had from the 1920s. Many Arabs of various backgrounds uh, came into the area, particularly during the 1920s, when a lot more work started to be made available through the economic growth by the uh, Jews coming back into the land at that time, because uh, that was after the Turks had been uh, tipped out by the British. So it's a very complex situation, which is now before the Israeli Supreme Court. Now, obviously we have great sympathy for the people who are caught up in the middle of this. There's no simple way out for like the ones who are having this argument the properties and also the ones in Gaza who have been bombed. As we know, the Hamas do fire their rockets from civilian areas, so it's inevitable Israel going to fire back at those. And so it goes on. 
and that then becomes gets into the world opinion. And the world opinion, of course, sees these people being killed or injured and has been led to a lot of pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli rallies. And as we've seen that uh, when the Palestinian civilians get killed or injured, it does generate a lot of opinion against Israel. It does seem they go out of their way to avoid as much as they can, but it can't be helped at times. But then again, this is there's always, unfortunately, there's collateral damage in all wars. We think of the dreadful suffering in Syria and Yemen and other places which has gone on for years. No simple solution to any of that. Uh, the real cause is the, the, the property one is just a, a bit of a window dressing. Uh, this one is a comment from the defence editor of the UK Telegraph newspaper. He's saying the reality is that Palestinian militants, together with their backers in Islamist regimes, and I've noted those two, we'll see them later, Iran and Turkey have been waiting for an excuse to provoke a confrontation with Israel. The Hamas missiles, which are manufactured locally, are based on Iranian designs. And one of the primary aims of all of this increased military activity is to derail former US President Donald Trump's breakthrough in the Arab-Israeli peace process. Because Hamas and the PLO don't like that at all, because they're getting sidelined whilst other Arab nations are coming on board with peace treaties with Israel. So that's a lot of the background. This hatred of Israel goes deep. There's the Hamas Charter, where they talk there about uh, that Israel can only exist until they invalidate it, as they say. And then from Article 13, that ends with saying there is no solution to the Palestinian problem except by jihad. So that's been around for some years now, but it, it reflects the, the views they hold on Israel as entrenched uh, hatred of the place. And a relatively recent one from the Ayatollah Khomeini from, from the Iranian side, that Israel is not a state but a terrorist garrison. The fight against this despotic regime is the fight against oppression and terrorism and is a public duty to fight against this regime. So we can see there the, the difficulty of dealing with uh, the whole situation, this entrenched attitude. should also mention, of course, though, that that doesn't mean that everything that Israel does is correct. It doesn't mean that we endorse the activities of the Israeli government, uh, nor do we endorse the views of some of the extreme uh, Israeli views that they have a right to just oppress Arabs because God said the land was theirs. It might be the case that it will be revealed at some point when it's fully revealed, but that doesn't give them the right to really oppress the people who live within uh, Israel itself and others. But nevertheless, these are the issues that keep bubbling along in that area. Uh, it's also thought that part of the current activity is to do with uh, you know, welcome Mr. US President and uh, because they could see opportunity here with Biden taking a different approach to Trump, including him, you know, he's back in trying to restore that, uh, recognising the Houthi group in Yemen. as It doesn't say they're a terrorist organisation anymore. He wants to resume negotiations with Iran over the nuclear deal and he's reinstated the aid to the Palestinians. Now, Hamas has jumped on that as a good opportunity to stir things along whilst all that's occurring. That's got a shift from Trump, and again, we don't express a view on one president's view versus the other politically, but we can see that the various in approach is dealing with these current issues. Now, other activities will take place in in the in that area, and again, we've got to do this without all the background detail, but the Prophet Ezekiel talks about when Israel is back in the land, events will occur and northern nations will pour down against them in a great battle. And he talks there about Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, often taken to be Russia. A lot of commentary about why that is so, but we won't tackle that. And he says they will come in and we follow that down a bit further. The great host, all of them, with buckler and shield wielding swords. Persia, as it was called then, in fact called Persia for practically all of its lifetime, which is Iran, and it's of interest, we imagine, push and put, uh, nations in that area also, Libya, Ethiopia probably, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, and there's a lot of connection that Gomer refers to some European countries, Beth Togoma, generally regarded as Turkey, and these are the ones that will come against Israel in what they call the last day. So events will still occur there that will be difficult uh, in the Chapter continues by saying they're going to come from the uttermost parts of the north, which again adds to 
potentially a Russian invasion, and they will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land. And then we go to a very important point, that the nations may know me. This is to reveal the power of God when he destroys that nation. They say not because Israel individually or people within it are more righteous than others, but it will develop and show God's plan to the world as it leads to the return of Christ. Prophet well, Daniel spoke about those last days when all these things occur. And he said, in the days of those kings, that those ones at that time, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. And it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So a kingdom is to be established with the backing of God. And that's a separate topic to go into in detail, and that will be covered at some stage. And the other prophet Micah talks about these. Again, we're talking about these latter days, the last days of the times of mankind before God steps in. He talks about a mountain of the house of the Lord being established, the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. Then we note the location, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that kingdom will be centred in Jerusalem when all this turmoil is settled down. So just giving a summary there that we have Israel as custodians of God's word and his witness. They had laws which kept them separate. They were dispersed for disobedience. After 2,000 years they were returned, an amazing fulfilment of prophecy. Uh, a northern aggressor will attack Israel in the last days. The promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, will return. Jerusalem will be the centre of God's kingdom and there will be peace and justice for all nations. And we know that's all nations of the world, not just Jewish, but Arab and everybody else can be part of that. And uh, that is a time of peace, as the prophet Isaiah sums it up, they will not hurt or destroy and all my holy mount, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, that was a lot of information. It sure was. And if you're like me, you've probably got a lot of answers, but you've also got a lot of questions. I know I definitely do. And if you have any questions, you can email them to questions at cce.org.au on your screen. We'll field them during our live Q&A panel on Wednesday, June 16th where I will be moderating and we'll have Sid, our presenter, as well as some others from our community providing insights of their own. That sounds great. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation and please join us for the Q&A session on June 16th. See you then. See you then.